KFI AM 640. It's later with Mo Kelly live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. And at least we didn't have major breaking news, which are just up in the whole country over the course of the weekend. It was nice to have a semi normal weekend. I said semi, not completely normal, but it was semi normal. And I'm praying for Tawala Sharp right now, producer of the show. He's not in tonight. He is actually in Catalina. I'll tell that much. He talked about it on the air. He went out across the water. And if you don't know, Tuwala is, is reticent to do anything which involves water, deep water. And he got on the boat to go over to Catalina today. And then I saw the news of an earthquake. And I thought, did the earthquake happen when he was on the boat? Before the boat? Or after the boat? Because Tuala can be very sensitive to earthquakes. And, and, and you know the story by now. It's 4.9 magnitude. You know how I feel about that? It's not a 5.0. Do we have a betting pool on this? Like uh, whether or not Tuala vomited or anything? You know what? I think if he did, he would have let us know. In the way that you let us know when you got COVID. <laughs> you, you made sure we all knew it's our fault. If we didn't have you out in, in, in this public event, you wouldn't have caught COVID. I uh, think yeah, let's not make this about me. I'm just <laughs> kinda, I, you're taking all the sport out of whether or not Tuala vomited. That's all I want to know. No, I, look, I have not heard from him. I did not text him, if only because I didn't want to jinx him in any way. If something bad happened, I think we would have heard about it. If something off-putting happened, he probably would have let us know. Well, I guess we'll find out soon enough. No news is good news from where I sit. But if you wanted to start a betting pool, I mean, <laughs> I, I'd, I think I'd he did throw fine. In a couple bucks. Yeah, no, no, I, I would bet that he did fine. I think his his fears were completely unfounded, and I don't think he would get seasick. And it's like what, maybe a 20, 25 minute boat ride to Catalina, if I remember correctly. Well, it's not those, long. sometimes those can hit you kind of hard. Well, I got to tell you, and they can. I think he's going to be just fine. Ooh, just you know, fine. All right. But I was talking about the 4.9 magnitude earthquake, and if Twella were here, he probably would bring that up, and I would say in response, it's not a five, so what do you want me to say? I didn't feel it. I honestly didn't feel it. If it happened, it says it happened about 14 miles east, northeast of Barstow at 1 p.m. today, according to the USGS. Originally, it was listed at a 4.7, and then they upgraded it to a 4.9, there were some aftershocks, which were 3.5 and 2.7, respectively. And according to CBS, the shaking was felt as far west as the L.A. area, including Burbank, Pasadena, and Studio City. I, from what I understand, folks here in the studio did feel it. Um, I heard uh, Duke of Sports, Eric Sklar, said that he felt it. I, when I live, where I live, I didn't feel anything. Nothing at all. Stefan, did you feel anything? Didn't feel one thing, and I was like sitting still. The only reason I even knew is because my mom texted me about it, and I'm like, I didn't feel anything. See, there's a reason why we don't talk about these things if it's less than five, because it's less than important. There was no damage. Nobody got hurt. No one died. We had two people end up dead near metro facilities this weekend. It's far more dangerous. Far more dangerous. Much rather talk about that than an earthquake in which no one was impacted. Nobody at all. Mark didn't feel it. Stefan didn't feel it. I didn't feel it. Producer Kiana, did you feel it? I actually did feel it. Okay, get off the mic. <laughs> Producer Kiana doesn't count, says she felt it. And outside of that, by and large, you know, if you felt it, okay, all right, yeah. And I felt the truck driving by my house today. But do you hear me talking about it here on KFI AM 640 where we're live everywhere in the iHeartRadio app? No, not at all. Not at all. But some other things we are going to talk about before the night is through. Yes, we're going to get to Metro next. There was a shooting at the Lamert Park Station on Saturday. There was a dead body on Metro tracks, evidently electrocuted. Uh, the person reportedly was running from police on Sunday. <sighs> If you want to talk about death, you got to talk about Metro. They kind of go hand in hand. And before I get to that, uh, there, there are other things that we need to talk about. And I don't talk about Metro just to say that L.A., the city or the county is falling apart. But you have to talk about these things which are happening time and time again. All right? If you went to, think of your favorite grocery store. 
I don't want to call any by name because then they think I'm picking on them. Think of your favorite grocery store. And if every time you turned around, there was a story of someone getting stabbed, shot, or electrocuted at your favorite grocery store, might that change your perception of it? Might that change your, your travel, uh, how you would probably do your sh grocery shopping? If every single day at your various grocery stores, I don't want to say Albertsons, Vaughn's, Ralph's, Pavilions, Gelson's, Trader Joe's, any one of those. If it happened all the time at the same one, wouldn't you say after a while, well, maybe that's not the safest place to do my grocery shopping. That's all I'm saying. We're going to go beyond the box score. Yes, if the beyond the box score was meant for anything, it was meant for a night like this. We'll talk about the opening ceremony at the Olympics. And don't be surprised. I'm a Christian. And I'll be weighing in. And I have an informed opinion. We will talk about the opening ceremony and also some of the other issues which have been transpiring at the Olympics. We'll also talk about how ESPN and Amazon are trying to secure the show inside the NBA. Remember I told you about that with Charles Barkley, Ernie Johnson, and Kenny the Jet Smith, how popular it is? Well, ESPN and Amazon, they're trying to get the rights so they can keep that story, excuse me, the show going. We have your weekly horoscope. I will give my non-spoiler review of Deadpool and Wolverine, as will Mark Ronner. We both saw it. If you want the spoiler-filled, profanity-laden version, you can find that on our podcast at KFIM640.com, the Later with Mo Kelly Show podcast, and also the Nerd Around Table podcast. There's also a, a visual one you can find at, at Mr. Mo Kelly, my Facebook page. You can actually see our faces and watch us cuss at each other and argue about this and so many other important things. We got to get into Comic-Con. That's an extension of that. Some major announcements were made at Comic-Con. You may know some of them, but you probably don't know all of them. So much to discuss after a very, very busy weekend. When we come back, we'll get into Metro and talk to you about those two dead bodies. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly On Demand from KFI AM 640. Back in the mid-2000s, my last job, I used to work down in Lamert Park. And it was an area which was changing drastically very quickly. They had just, at that time, when I was working in that area, just announced plans to revitalize the area, bring in a new metro stop. They were going to have an above-ground train running up and down Crenshaw Boulevard. And it was going to be a massive project. It was going to be... Um, it's going to be tremendous for the area. It's going to bring in a lot of new businesses, which it did. It completely transformed the landscape. If you were there maybe 2008 and 2009 and you looked at it then as opposed to what it is right now in 2024, you would not even recognize it. It totally changed it. But at the same time, some of the problems still remain. And when I saw the news that uh, a man had been killed in a gang-related shooting on a metro station platform, then I said, yeah, yeah, certain things are not going to change. And this happened late Friday night, early Saturday morning. This is still an active scene here in Lamar Park where a shooting happened. Let me move out of the way so we can show you. LAPD is still inside of there of that parking lot where that shooting took place. It appears that the body is still in there as well. We did just see a tow truck leave. Uh, from the scene taking a, a black Chevy Malibu. Now take a look, this is what the scene looked like earlier when uh, the shooting happened. Now the, one man is dead following the shooting here at the Lamert Park Metro stop. Again, this is a homicide investigation. LAPD says it found a man suffering from a gunshot wound in the parking lot. And this happened just after midnight. As of now, no word if there were any arrests made, but the victim died here at the scene. We do know that Metro Metro has had a history with safety concerns. Uh, LA Metro is looking uh, for ways to crack down on fare evaders by implementing a tap in and tap out system across its entire system. And of course, this is stemming from uh, serious crimes on the transit system. Uh, again, back out here live as of now, no information uh, on the suspect description. Of course, this is an ongoing investigation. That's the first body that dropped this weekend. The second one ended up on the tracks. And it seems he was electrocuted. There have been conflicting published reports as to why or why he was down there. Some have said that he was trying to flee from police. That hasn't necessarily been confirmed. But I think that's a reasonable, 
reasonable assumption. And the man died Saturday after falling onto the Metro Red Line tracks in a tunnel between Universal City and North Hollywood. That's the same North Hollywood, which supposedly was down 40% in violent crime since late May. Officers were called to the 5300 block of Lancashire Boulevard at about 2.51 p.m. on Saturday. And this is a 30-year-old man who was pronounced dead at the scene. Here is a little more information on that from ABC7. In the meantime, tragedy on the Red Line subway tracks in North Hollywood near Universal City. The LAPD said... Wait a minute, is it a tragedy? Is it? If you start running in the tur tunnels and you get electrocuted, is it a tragedy? If you drive your car in front of a speeding train and you get clipped or hit broadside, is it a tragedy? Because you're not supposed to do either. Why? Because there's a, a possibility, a high possibility that you might end up on the wrong end of the business of a train. Meantime, tragedy on the Red Line subway tracks in North Hollywood near Universal City. The LAPD says a man was found unconscious and not breathing yesterday. They believed he touched the third rail and was electrocuted. The 30-year-old victim was not a Metro employee, and it's unclear how he wound up on the tracks. He walked his ass down there. That's how you get to the tracks. No one picked him up and carried him. He walked down there or ran down there touched the third rail and was electrocuted. The 30-year-old victim was not a Metro employee, and it's unclear how he wound up on the tracks. Train service has returned to normal. Did you hear that? Wasn't that nice of them? They let them know that train service had returned to normal. Beyond everything, it was all about... Train service has returned to normal. Got to make sure everyone gets there on time. Here's the serious point about all this. For all the discussion that we had last week about the whole tap in, tap out answer that they have, which is going to be going system-wide, I said it then, the tap-in, tap-out presumes that it's going to be in one of those fully contained, usually underground subway stops. You can't protect the parking lots. It doesn't impact the platforms. It doesn't impact anything which is outside of, you've never been on the subway before. Usually you have to go down some 100 steps or so it might be an escalator but you usually go down in to the terminals like a tunnel and when you're down there then you get to get your fare card that have like these vending machines and then you can use your fare card to get into the actual area where the trains are in other words the tap in tap out will have no impact on anything other than exiting one particular location and if they implement it everywhere it's only going to impact people who are trying to leave it doesn't protect the station in any way and it doesn't make it safer for people now does it make it possibly more difficult for people to get on and off the trains yes does that make it safer for the people getting on and off the trains no and that's what I don't understand why Metro won't get to the heart of the matter. It's not keeping fare jumpers from getting off the train. It's about providing an environment which is considerably safer than what it is right now. It's not the fare jumpers which are directly connected to the influx of bodies ending up on tracks or people getting shot. That doesn't connect. There is no connection there. Because the person who got shot probably wasn't trying to ride the train and the shooter probably wasn't trying to ride the train. But where these incidents keep happening is in and around the trains. And yes, you may want to protect just the riders, but the danger is not only to the riders. It's to the passersby. It's to the people who may be in the vicinity and the just proximity of this metro system. We can talk more about making sure people can't get off the train. But that's not going to make people safer. It's not going to make Mark Ronner safer. And I know he thinks about this daily. I know that he has deep-seated concerns about riding the Metro train. Well, you mentioned tap out. <laughs> and I was just wondering, do they focus group that? <laughs> well, you know, that's a great question. I'm tapped out. No, no, no. I, I, because the, the connotation does say something. It certainly does. And also, who do they ask? about this i know they have these ambassadors and they have these surveys that they send out but who is giving them the information or is making the decision in the marketing meeting that's pushing them in a certain direction 
Yeah, a little uh, a little bit more focus grouping on the whole tap out thing might be money well spent, I think. You, you think they'd name it in something a, different. In right. a system known for uh, <laughs> violence, but, maybe? Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, for, if you didn't catch that, tap out has a direct connotation and connection to MMA, violence, how a fight ends. It's called tapping out, if you didn't catch that. So to call it tapping out invariably makes people think of violence. And for you to name your new program that is going system-wide, to name it something which evokes imagery and iconography. <laughs> is it better or worse than KO? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. But tap out is probably not the best idea or naming convention for your latest plan to curb violence. Oops. That's all I'm saying. Back to the drawing board. On no, one, one. no one said it out loud. Okay. No, one, no one in the meeting said, you know what? Maybe we ought to call it something else. They, they, they may call it tap to exit or something like that, but people are going to call it tapping out. You know, you're tapping to get out. That's the colloquialism. Or like, I surrender with my ticket in little letters afterwards, like small letters in parentheses. I surrender you know, my, like, my ticket. Please don't shoot me. <laughs> you know, a little on the nose, but fair. And tap out, fair. is it? <laughs> No, no, it's fair. <laughs> okay. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. Obviously, California has an ongoing homelessness problem and there are different ideas about what we need to do to solve it. I think it's multifaceted. It's not just about getting homeless people off the streets, but getting them somewhere in which they are less likely to be homeless again. And also saying nothing of the people who are presently homeless, the people who are one paycheck away from homeless, the people who are going to be homeless next week. It's not a static number. It's not a static community. It's not like there's a finite number of people who are on the street who are going to end up on the street. That number fluctuates for a number of variables in the equation. Last week, we told you about how California Governor Gavin Newsom had signaled to cities and communities through his executive order, which is going to require state agencies to remove homeless encampments from state property. And I said, okay, don't get too excited. It only has to do with state property. All Gavin Newsom can do is basically send a message of encouragement to cities and counties saying, hey, why don't you follow suit? London Breed, the mayor of San Francisco, is going to do just that. She has also embraced the ruling. She said last week that armed with the high court's decision, talking about uh, the um, the U.S. Supreme Court decision, which reversed the June uh, reversed the ruling, saying that cities in California and the West may enforce laws restricting homeless encampments on sidewalks and other public property. Because of that ruling. It has inspired Gavin Newsom and now London Breed and actually other mayors in the Bay Area to follow suit. She said last week that being armed with the high court's decision, she will spearhead a quote unquote very aggressive effort to clear homeless encampments beginning next month, which is only a couple of days away. She also said the effort would include criminal penalties for refusing to disperse. And that's what I want to focus in on. I think everybody, I think I think it's fair to say everybody. I don't think I know of anyone who disagrees with homelessness being an issue which needs to be addressed. I personally have always said that there is a health and safety issue. You have the hepatitis alphabet, A, B, and C you have to worry about. There are other safety aspects to homelessness that are also connected to it. Not just the general public safety, but the safety of homeless people. We know that they are often victimized while they are living on the street. There is that aspect, but there's also what are you going to do to enforce this? London Breed is saying that there will be criminal penalties for refusing to disperse. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that if I'm homeless and I don't move my tent from a certain location, you're going to put me in jail? Then what? Are you going to send me a notice to appear in court? Yeah, okay, to what address? And if I don't show up, what are you going to do? Arrest me the next time you see me? And after you arrest me and I can't afford bail, whether we do uh, honor the no-cash bail system or not, 
There's nothing I can do to accommodate the process of a civil charge. Or what if it's just a, a citation? Are you going to charge a homeless person a fine of $50 for not moving their homeless tent? These are the things that we need to actually be serious about and work through. Because I know it says, uh, I should say, I know it sends the message to the media and I know it sends a message to constituencies and political opposition that we're getting a tough on homelessness, that we're getting aggressive on fighting homelessness. But in actuality, you're not, act you're not really doing either because you can't enforce any criminal or even civic penalties for being homeless. How are you going to tell someone who's living on the street they have to move under the threat of citation or imprisonment? What is that supposed to mean? Who is that supposed to encourage to move? How does that actually address homelessness? And if I, and I have been on, uh, uh, I've dealt with foreclosure. So I know what it's like to wonder where you're going to live next. I know what that's like. And I remember what I was thinking and feeling at the time. Now, I, I don't know if I would have ended up homeless, but I do know there was a, a great period of uncertainty as far as what I was going to do. And a person who was desperate on that level really does not care about the threat of imprisonment, does not care about some $300 fine when they couldn't even pay their rent or they're uh, desperate to find their next meal. I don't know what the answer is to homelessness. And I look to you, Mark Varner, because I think you may have a thought or two. Well, I, in all the discussions about it, well, two things. First of all, you get the idea that they'd really just prefer to appoint David Copperfield to make all the homeless people disappear. And they don't want to deal with the roots of the problem. Um, but the second is this lack of acknowledgement in a lot of the discussions about homelessness of how close so many people are. One emergency right. away. Uh, you know, uh, losing your job away, just, you know, one or a series of medical issues away or raising your rent. We have constant stories here on KFI about how buying homes is increasingly out of reach for more and more people. And you just have to context is important in this discussion. I don't think it's about context. I think people want to and I say people that includes politicians and lay people have no desire to actually address homelessness. They don't want to see homelessness anymore. Right. They just want it to go away. And that's not how things work in the real adult world. You have to deal with it. But no one is trying to deal with it. And I know it's it's cool to talk tough about it. And that's why I talk about uh, Gavin Newsom and London Breed. They're going to be more aggressive regarding homelessness. But I have yet to see any real solution to it. And, and it may not be a problem you can solve. It could be like, you know, world hunger. It's not something you can solve per se. It's something you can manage and deal with and, and incrementally make a difference. But I, I don't think in this capitalistic society, and it does go back to capitalism, that we have any real appetite or real, real desire to solve homelessness. Well, it goes... Uh, back to greed, not just capitalism, but specifically greed. I mean, we've got countless places to live sitting empty. At the same time, we've got jillions of homeless people. And I got to tell you, Mo, I really bristle at some of the language that's used in these uh, in these descriptions, like getting tough on homelessness. Who are you getting tough with? What, what are you punching down on? What What is this? Because in many ways, it has been equated to crime and lawlessness. And if you put it within those... Th that context, it's easier for people like you and me, when I say you and me, just lay people, to accept whatever the government chooses to do with human beings. It really is sometimes the language of punching down. And as a person and a journalist, uh, I that really whips my head right around. I don't like that. No, and that's why I talk about it through just through my terms where I know how close I was to being homeless. And I think people overestimate how close they are not to being homeless. I think they assume that it's those people over there and it could never be them. One medical diagnosis away. Yeah, what's the uh, phrase there? But for the grace of God, uh, there was, um, there's been quite a few years in a row where statistics show that like something like uh, nearly half the population would be destroyed by a $400 emergency expenditure. Yep. 
Uh, and yep. so a little a little humility on this subject would go a long way, I think. Well, I, I don't laugh, but it almost like I giggle inside in a way because people don't see or hear themselves when someone has a medical emergency or someone passes. Invariably, the GoFundMe fund me goes up or the Kickstarter and they're asking for money. It's like, don't you see this is another example of the problems that we have and that delves into the whole issue of universal health care and being able to find affordable health care. But I'm quite sure the people who are homeless is disconnected on many levels. Oh, there's no question. And in my mind, you can boil it down to don't live your life in such a way that you could ever be mistaken for the bad guy in a Charles Dickens novel. OK, and so that's what I think of when I hear some of the, the ways that homeless people are talked about and dismissed and just hugely disrespected when any of us could become homeless anytime. Well, I bristle when I hear, and this is something I hear commonly, when I hear, well, if you can't afford to live in California, you need to move somewhere else. Um, okay. If you're, if you're homeless, what do you want them to do? Uh, and I'm not talking about working homeless. I'm talking about the folks who may not have a car, who may be living in a cardboard box. You want them to walk to Nevada? Yeah, when people have a series of misfortunes that winds up with them being homeless, what do you want them to do exactly again? <laughs> how far, how many steps ahead would you like them to plan when they've experienced a catastrophe that's landed them on the street? And, and, and I know it's not one size fits all. It's not a monolithic community. Some are dealing with uh, mental health issues. Some are dealing with drug addiction issues. All of that. It's, it's not, it's not a, a single issue. Uh, it's much more comprehensive. But to your point, Mark, we can do a better job of how we discuss it and not try to marginalize them as less than human or other than. Oh, it yeah. And I've been I've had some some brushes with misfortune just like you have. Like, oh, boy, the, somehow suddenly freelancing looks a lot like being unemployed. Things have really slowed down here. Yeah. What are we going to do? And that could happen to anybody. Oh, it can happen to anyone. And you will have a different outlook if and when it happens to you. And it may not be right now. It may be five years from now. It may be 10 years from now. It could be next week. But the problem is you don't know when it's going to happen despite all of your planning, all of your preparation. And although I think all of us would like to see the end of homelessness, I don't know if all of us are ready to actually deal with the human element of homelessness. It's later with Mo Kelly, KFI AM 640. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. And when we come back, we're going to tell you about this feminine phenomenon. I know it's a made up word, but that's what they're calling it. A feminine phenomenon. California's first women's sports bar. Watch me, it's called, and it's opened in Long Beach. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. If you've listened to Later with Mo Kelly, you know I do genuinely appreciate women's sports. I prefer women's tennis to men's tennis. I love watching the WNBA. Uh, I prefer. I wouldn't say I prefer women's soccer, but I enjoy women's soccer just about as much as men's soccer. And I've always had that affinity for women's sports. But I know intimately if I were to seek out a sports bar to watch the WNBA or something like that, it'd be virtually impossible to find it. I would have to go to a bar where I knew the bartender or a sports bar where there are not a lot of people there. So you can ask whoever's betting the TVs to turn it to a WNBA game. But you're not going to have a place which is exclusive to that. A couple of years ago, and we talked about it on, um, I think we talked about it with later Mo Kelly. I definitely talked about it, I think, with the Mo Kelly show. Talked about this bar in Portland called the Sports Bra, which was an all female women's sports sports bar. They had nothing but female employees. You walk in, they'd have nothing but um, women's sports on the TVs. I visited it. My, my nephew was graduating from Lewis and Clark College in Portland. I had a chance to go by there. It was great food, great ambiance, great people there. It was just a typical sports bar. The only thing different, honestly, was what was on the TV screens. And maybe you noticed the jerseys were all of female athletes. But a sports bar is a sports bar. Nothing real different. And I knew when I went into the sports bra in Portland that there was potential for that to, that idea at least. It's not connected, but the idea to expand. And now 
we have something very similar here in Long Beach called Watch Me. Hey there, we're in Long Beach from L.A. Sparks to Angel City. That's right, we're representing because they're representing a brand new movement, the first and only one right here in California. Watch me. All right, we're watching you, Jax. What is this all about here? We are predominantly women's sports. We're here to celebrate women's sports. We're here to make an inclusive space that anybody and everyone who loves women's sports can come in. Look at all these big screens. How many screens are we looking at? How many games are going to be shown here? And how much energy is going to be right here in this room? A boatload of energy, 26 TVs, just to make sure that everybody's catching what they want. Why is this so important to create a space like this? Why do you feel like women's sports is so underrepresented? This is a decades-long dream for me to create a space where women can go to watch sports and feel 100% fine about what they're doing. Anybody and everybody should be able to watch whatever they want and not feel that they're sort of shamed or they're not smart enough or they don't understand strategy. We will be packing this place with people who get that and who understand that. All right, when people said this is a crazy idea, it's never going to take off here, what did you say? In short, watch me. That's right. <laughs> this area is full of people who love women's sports. Young people can come in here after their sports games and, and hang out and see who they can be later. All right, Chef, that looks delicious. What are we serving up here? Here we have a half barbecued chicken with a uh, secret barbecue sauce. What do you think the secret sauce of this whole place is? Because it's definitely a vibe. <laughs> um, probably the ranch dressing. No, uh, <laughs> as soon as they told me what they were doing, I was 100% on board. I was so excited that there are more people that care about inclusivity in the world and representing, and representation always matters. Yeah, definitely, I plan to go to watch me in Long Beach, because as I told you earlier, if it's anything like the sports bra in Portland, it ought to be a, a great time. And this is actually starting to become a trend where you're going to see more and more bars just like these popping up around the country because obviously they've identified an underserved segment. I know women, not all women, but some women who don't necessarily want to go to a traditional sports bar because they don't want to deal with all the male testosterone and ignorance of a drunk man. I get that. I really do. And if you offer a, a somewhat different environment, but one in which you can enjoy sports and also women's sports, I think there's something there. In fact, if, if you're listening right now and you're connected to the uh, to watch me, give us a call and so we can have you on the air. Jack Steiner would love to hear from you. It's later with Mo Kelly, and along those lines, we're going to go beyond the box score next with Jackie Ray. Talk about this Olympics opening ceremony, and I'm going to weigh in from the perspective of a knowledgeable Christian. So if you want to come for me, you can come for me at your own peril. KFI AM 640, we're live everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. An independent voice in a world full of retweets. KFI. And KOST HD2. Los Angeles, Orange County. Live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app.